Andrew Hetzel. Welcome to the Map It Forward podcast. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's an honor. It's really great to have you. I hesitated with the whole Map It Forward podcasting because I had to remember which podcast. <laughs> we launched a new podcast Wait, we're here to this talk week. About cooking, right? I, I have my recipes ready. And my yeah. other podcast, I got done with talking to a dominatrix last week. So, oh. Oh. so I just have to make sure <laughs> that we've got the right things all lined up in the right place. Let's Understood. talk yeah. coffee. <laughs> You know, I'm not one to judge. <laughs> so if that's what you want to do, you go ahead, sunshine. <laughs> I have a I have a new method of oh, encouraging shit. coffee quality. <laughs> You've already piqued everybody's interest. There we go. Uh how you doing, mate? I'm I'm doing fine. I mean, remarkably fine considering how awful everything is. Yeah. It's intense. And a lot of people are not doing fine. And yeah. um particularly here in Hawaii. Um, so for everyone watching, listening, I, I live in Hawaii, which has been, although we're not badly affected by the uh, disease itself because we're a um, you know, series of little islands out in the middle of the ocean so we can shut off tourism, the state's economy is heavily dependent on tourism. Right. So unemployment rates have been as high as about 30%. And wow. um, it hurts a lot of people who are already struggling to live in a very expensive place. Mm. Oh, so, I mean, California, I'm always aware so of that I get when that. people ask me. Yeah, when people ask me how I'm doing and I say I'm doing fine, I, I'm, I'm doing great um, because I have a job. I'm able to do my job from home. Yeah. I, I don't have to go out and, and put myself and my wife doesn't have to go out and put herself at risk. But at the same time, we're very aware that a lot of people are, are suffering. Yeah. And there's a new layer of that suffering that's kind of creeping into the Hawaiian coffee community. Before we get on to mm -hmm. all of the other stuff mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about today, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. why don't we talk about what has, is starting to unfold in Hawaii where, uh, with regards to the coffee rust that they mm. have confirmed is, I believe the USDA has confirmed as of today uh, that the coffee rust is in Hawaii. Do, why don't you tell us what you know? Yeah, I, honestly, it's not a whole lot more than that. I mean, as, as far as what is actually known. Uh, but um, what I am aware of is that members of the Hawaii Coffee Association were notified over the weekend that there had been uh, what was believed to be coffee rust detected in a uh, coffee growing area of the island of Maui uh, and uh, that it was being taken very seriously, had been sent to a lab for verification, which apparently has come back today or may have even come back yesterday. There was a press conference with the governor and um, it appears that uh, the rust uh, fungus is present in Hawaii for the first time in Ever, known right? history. Yeah. 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 It's one of the last, I mean, Honestly, it's it was only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, rust is everywhere, and there's so much mobility. Although ironic that you know while on lockdown we seem to have discovered rust. <laughs> so where did it come from? <laughs> um, uh, there's so much mobility in the industry. You have uh, particularly with with migrant labor um, that come from Central America and sometimes from the Philippines or Thailand to pick coffee here um, right. seasonally. Um, it, it's really only a matter of time until all of these um, you know, biohazards, pests, and disease make their way to little remote islands. It's so. Um, hopefully, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture has a plan in place. They're they're usually pretty good at responding to these sorts of things, as they did with the coffee berry borer, mm -hmm. which uh, became uh, you know, badly active here in you know, five or seven years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was, but. Um, that was a similar situation. Hopefully they can keep it contained, isolated on Maui for a while. Uh, but really, just like the coffee berry borer, just like any other disease, pest, COVID-19, it's really just a matter of time. Does it typically travel through a number of different mechanisms? So not just by person to plant contact, but can it be travel, can it travel through the 
the wind and through water and things like that? It, well, it, it's um, it's a fungus, so it, it, they they have spores. spores, and those spores can survive. They're very. I mean, that's that's why they're able to travel because it's a it's a fungus. It, it can hibernate and reactivate and. Um, so it's my understanding, I'm not an expert in this area, but it's my understanding from the you know, lectures I've attended on these sorts of things that um, uh, coffee uh, rust travels on tools uh, with workers. It can travel on wow. um, samples. It can travel on um, jute bags if they've gone from from coffee producing country to coffee producing yeah, country. Wow. So uh, it's it's very portable. And when the conditions are right for fungus growth, you have a lot of rain like we've had when you have, you know, warm conditions, cool nights, um, it's life. So it'll grow. And what, you being an ag expert. So what's the, uh, what's the, I guess the economic ramifications if, mm-hmm. if something like this takes over, just, yeah, just yeah. very quickly I, I, before you do say that. I focus that. more on the economic side of things. Yeah. That's, that's a really ugly side for this, uh, for this particular, uh, disease it causes so that what happens is the leaf, um, uh, rust fungus, um, kills off the leaves of the plant. And that's how the plant is able to create energy. It's how it's able to, uh, build, um, cells that make the rest of the plant and our, our coffee seeds that we love. Uh, and, um, you know, when this pest is going unmitigated, it'll cause, you know, 80% uh, dieback of, of the uh, crops. So you're looking at a near total loss, potentially. So it's a yield I mean, it, thing? It, 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 it'll, just, it'll kill the plants yeah. is what happens. So, yeah, um, the uh, entire industry, uh, coffee industry of Sri Lanka was destroyed by it. It's had done serious damage in Kenya. It's done um, just in the last 10 years, uh, significant damage in Central and South America as well. Mm. And until you get it under control, it's going to really hurt. And in what's already a difficult time, because so much of Hawaii's coffee industry is dependent on tourism as well. Right. So a, a lot of those, you know, um, you know, what's harvested some of it's you know shipped to the mainland to roasters. Uh, a good percentage of it goes to Asia, particularly Japan. Uh, but a lot of it is sold in in uh, retail bags in stores, mm-hmm. in airport, in duty free shops. And without that traffic, they've had a pretty significant significant drop off in in volume. So, how long will it take their econ- like the coffee economy to recover from something like this if it gets out of Maui? Um, well, it, it'll be years, uh, to, to, uh, have a broad spectrum response of, um, farm management and treatment there. There are fungicides that are available and, and one of the few, they do, um, one of the, the, the difficulty in most coffee producing regions is that they're really expensive. And Ah. if you're a farmer, in Honduras, for example, you might pay the entire value of your expected harvest to treat your plants. And that treatment, here's, here's the tricky thing. The treatment has to happen at the beginning of the season. So it's not like you can wait till the end of the season and see if your plants were affected or not. You have to use it as like a prophylactic measure. It has to be sprayed. So, wow. you got to use the, the earnings exactly. from the last harvest. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm going to spend all of next year's earnings just to make sure I have a crop this year and I don't know if I'm going to be affected by this disease or not. Um, the, the, um, the bright side, uh, if there is one for Hawaii is that our coffee is really expensive. Yes. <laughs> so, um, a $1 per pound investment in a fungicide may not be a deal breaker. I mean, it's going to hurt. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's going to make already expensive coffee, very expensive, and it's going to be disproportionately damaging to the, um, the, the, the larger bulk of production, particularly coming off of Maui and Kauai that doesn't have the same consumer reputation as, say, Kona. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, it's a lot easier to absorb a dollar when your yeah. green coffee price is 15 to 20 than it is when rest. your green coffee price is $1.50. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So it's it's going to hit 
I mean, this goes to the heart of privilege, doesn't it? Um, it's still going to hurt them, but at the same time, because they've built such an incredible brand around Hawaiian coffee, it's quite insulated as well, isn't it? It's this idea that... Oh, it's... Yeah. One thing I don't understand, um, speaking with Madeline um, from... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shout out I mean, to Madeline. She's amazing. Coffee. We all know each other. Yeah, great. absolutely. Um, so speaking to Madeline on the podcast uh, some time ago, we're probably due to have Maddie back on the podcast soon. But speaking to her on the podcast, she was helping me understand that it's very difficult to get coffee into Hawaii. That's It's such mm. a protected um, yeah. industry. So how... Is it just through tools and things like that? It just sounds quite strange as to how something like that could get in. Um, probably. I mean, I, I biosecurity is not my specialty, but I mean, I would, I would guess. I mean, based on what information I have read and lectures I've attended on pests and and. Um, their mobility, it, it most likely comes off of clothes yeah. and tools that are associated Just with workers and, and people have, who have visited other farms as yeah. well. I mean, it could be, could be visitors that have been to a farm and just brushed up against the wrong thing and, you know, carried it with them on their boots or you never know. I, I, when I um, travel to coffee production areas, I always bring an old pair of shoes and then at the end of the trip, you throw away the old pair of shoes. Yeah. And then when you you know get home, the, the first thing you do is everything goes straight into the wash, just to try and control those things. But I'm I don't expect that everyone is quite that that careful. Yeah, our customs uh, into Australia are savage that way. You'd know that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I know it very well. Yes. <laughs> But they love coffee. We always have that oh, absolutely. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> have you been on a farm in the last 14 days? Uh, which farms were they? Did you wash your shoes off? Et cetera, et cetera. Did you touch any animals? Yeah. Did you do- yes, I've, I, I know the checklist very well. They're, they're very thorough. And that's, that's important because yeah. in a sense, I mean, Australia is, is similar to Hawaii. It's, it's an independent land mass. Mm-hmm. I mean, Australia is much larger, obviously, but... Um, it's very easy for, um, you know, invasive species of all kinds to just wreak havoc on the environment. Yeah. And this is when it beca- you start to see it in real life why it's so important to protect these industries, particularly yeah. when there's, you know, such a heavy burden on agricultural product being such a big part of the economy. As yeah, is- yeah. Well, back back to that, that point that Madeline made um, – or, or that discussion you had with her about mm. how difficult it is to bring coffees of other origins into Hawaii. I, I don't think that's all bad. No, um, I don't either. I think it's Yeah, I think, I, I think it's, it's actually good and, and has some uh, biosecurity impact uh, and has a, a big economic impact as well. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there needs to be more of a precision approach to crafting that type of policy so that you're not inhibiting other parts of industry from growing, you know, so for, right. I'll give you an example mm. there, you, you can't import coffee, any green coffee from Africa. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She was, she was saying that. <laughs> so that's, if you're a roaster, <laughs> that's a pretty significant drawback Yeah. Um, where you're unable then to access some of the world's highest quality, most interesting, whatever adjectives you want to use coffees. Um, it, and, and to me, it seems arbitrary. I, I don't understand why is, you know, Africa um, forbidden while at the same time, Southeast Asia, you can bring green coffee in so long as you have a permit and follow the procedure. So it's, it seems like maybe Trump's on have- the coffee board. You never know. <laughs> no, he doesn't drink coffee. Uh, I think that's, uh, it's fine. Policy. He's taking other it stuff that help lot, him, but it? it would absolutely explain a lot. He doesn't <laughs> want the immigration of coffee from Africa. Yeah, <laughs> Obviously, yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Obviously I'm joking. Functions. Please don't send me a whole bunch of, or, or send me a whole bunch of hate mail. I don't give any yeah. fucks anymore. Seriously. Oh, so <laughs> send them directly to Lee. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, but, uh, 
but, but yes, yeah, so I think there's there's an opportunity, you know, to maybe with a, a little more precision to craft a policy that allowed smaller batches or certain procedures for importing green coffee that would allow mm. roasters to then be able to utilize some of those products to the benefit of all Hawaii's economy. Right, I, and I get it from a from you know protecting the biodiversity of mm. the local agricultural community but at the mm-hmm. same time it's gatekeeping flavor profiles and it's gatekeeping yeah. a whole bunch of stuff so you know so I, i'm drinking <laughs> this is kona i mean i'm drinking kona coffee right now which is excellent uh-huh. for and i'm drinking this. ethiopian coffee right now shout out well, to perspective go. roasters <laughs> I, I was just gonna say to uh, big island coffee roasters in Puna. and um uh, it, it's great you know it's it's a really great coffee is is a, an average coffee drinker going to pay, uh, I, I don't know the roasted price off the top of my head, but if I had to guess, I'd so, say it's somewhere in the range of about $60 a pound Sweet baby um, Jesus. for roasted coffee. I, I do the conversions, the ounces to dollars and so, but, but it's, it's prohibitive. And, and that really, you know, I think there's more that could be gained from having more variety right. in certain, in developing the skills of the roasters and the retail here instead of always just shooting for the the lowest um, quality that they can, you know, so that a, a, a product can be priced competitively for consumers. And especially if, I mean, it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves if the, the Roya does start taking off. Uh, and let's hope it doesn't. But if yield oh, the, is affected, yeah, if yeah, the fungus yeah, takes yeah. off and there's yeah. a, a limited supply, this is where supply and demand starts to become a really interesting economic phenomenon to track, right? I, I should start hoarding my sixty dollar a pound coffee <laughs> right now. It's gonna and be worth it. Sell it for gold. <laughs> <laughs> or Bitcoin. No, it's true. And that, that did happen. We saw some of that with the um the berry bore uh, as well, which which did significant damage and particularly in Kona, uh, the the primary smallholder coffee growing region of the state um and yields dropped oh boy i should i would have looked this up if i thought we were going to talk about it but probably about Sorry. 30 40, I did, as much as 30 percent 40 percent yeah i did spring um, this on you like 30 seconds before we came no, on okay. the podcast okay. hey, throw it at me <laughs> coffee it was so funny james and i <laughs> the last episode james and i were talking about that the fact that she was coming on the podcast right before the conversation started and I'm like, shit, we've got to start the conversation. He's like, uh, when that episode's ready, it'd be interesting to watch. Right now, let's jump into a conversation about coffee and get really serious. So I, I think you should create a new podcast which mixes like sex industry workers and coffee industry workers. Call it, call it sex, sex, sex and, coffee. and coffee. Well, I'll let and you do that. Have, like, up on sex, the coffee and trade. Floor. There we go. <laughs> Sex, coffee, and trade. That sounds like a great podcast. On our panelists, we have an economist, we have a prostitute. We <laughs> Mate, let me tell you, go check out the episode on the Love and Other Delusions podcast with Contessa. Mm. It was incredible to see her talk about the stuff that she talked about. She's she's only ever wanted to be a dominatrix her whole life. Huh. That was the only career she ever wanted and she's been doing well, it for 20 years. She makes a fucking killing doing it. Excuse I the bet. pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's on her business. <laughs> but, yeah, it was just really fascinating and I'm sitting there like a deer in headlights asking her all these questions because wow. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, and uh, cool. I look like an absolute novice. Um, but it was a lot of fun and she brought toys and she showed me a bunch of stuff and it was fantastic. It was really, really fun. Um, so anyone who wants to check it out, go check out Love and Other Delusions. For all of, for all of those displaced farmers in Hawaii <laughs> you want and elsewhere <laughs> that are looking for something that's another growth industry, you too could be a dominatrix. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch that to USAID. As an, as an episode. Dominatrix training program. <laughs> I've got enough on my plate, trust me. Outplacement out, out for farmers. The most fun part about it was she ended the conversation because she's in Sydney. And uh, I said to her, you know, this was so great. We should catch up for a coffee when I come back to Sydney. And during it, she's lying across her bed and she's got a whip in her hand. <laughs> And she and she's she says, Can't wait to have you back in Sydney as she 
as she taps her whip on her hand wow. and raises her eyebrow. I'm like, I'm so scared right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to seeing you for coffee in a public place. <laughs> She's awesome though. She's just so yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to coffee. <laughs> We could stay talking about dominatrix all day and still not get bored. So let's talk about PNG and let's talk. Mm. There's a couple of things I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about PNG. Sure. I also want to talk to you about the relationship between retail and the value mm. chain. Yeah. So you choose what you want to what you want to talk about first, and we'll go from there. I, I think the <laughs> relationship between you know, production and consumption is a good segue to what's happening uh -huh. in Papua New Guinea and, and also other origins right now. Are you getting too much glare off that window? No, I just realized no, you're it's getting good. sunny outside. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been a, a pet peeve of mine. I've, I've worked in the coffee industry um, in many different capacities for going on about 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, I came here as a, well, let's say a tourist consumer and in, you know, someone who here was being Hawaii? In coffee. No, well, um, actually that too, but, uh, but also the coffee industry okay. as a whole, I, I, I didn't have a you know profession that brought me here. I just sort of showed up one day and, and then suddenly I was part of the, the fabric. So say all of uh, us that, yeah, that's, that's a lot of people. I didn't realize that at the time, uh -huh. but that's not an unusual way to join the coffee industry. It's kind of like when the circus rolls to town, you just start, you know, cleaning up after the elephants. And next thing you know, you're, <laughs> you're riding the, the elephant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, I had, I had had another business. I was young when I started my first business. It was moderately su successful and no, you know, Zuckerberg or anything like that, but did well well enough that I could figure out what I wanted to do next. And I'd always been a lover of coffee, a heavy drinker of coffee. And I thought, oh, let's, let's see how this works. Okay. And um, I what started What was your learning. business, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> it was a little bit different. I mean, to me, it all feels like the same thing. But uh -huh. when I tell people, they're really shocked. I, I used to um, have a company that manufactured um, – uh, audio visual systems that were used in marketing and advertising. So when you'd walk into a retail store like a Costco and there'd be like a shelf talker at, at the end of the aisle that had a video displaying okay. some product, I, I manufactured some of those. And, okay. and uh, in fact, the, the largest application we had was background audio where the disc players that I manufactured were used in you know, like all the Chili's restaurants and, and okay. lots of different things. And they, they play music in the background. And what was different about them is that they could only play certain discs. And, and that's important in the U.S. I don't know if the same rules exist in, in Australia, but if you have a commercial outlet, and, and this is true for coffee shops as well, so maybe this is a good educational session. Um, if, you, if you're playing music, consumer music, off of, you know, a consumer... Uh, now, I guess a streaming site back then in the 1990s, it was off of a, a compact disc or an audio cassette. You could be hit with significant fines. Mm, uh, because, yeah, exactly. Because you're not paying the, the correct licensing to use that material in a commercial environment. And, and I mean, serious fines. Uh, the, the fee is, I think, somewhere in the range of $150,000 mm. per incident. Yep, per song. Per location, per yep. song. Yeah. So if you've got someone, you know, if you, let's say you've got a chain of 10 shops and everyone's playing their own favorite music in it, if you're caught, I mean, that could be a business ending fee. So, so, you know, I had worked in retail just as, you know, as a school job and was always told never to do that. And I remember that when I got out in the world and started to um, work in technology and video advertising and marketing, um, decided to design a machine that couldn't play ordinary compact discs, but could play ones that had a special code put on them. And that right. was, that was the secret sauce. That's all you needed. So retailers were then very excited that they could install these machines in thousands, tens of thousands of locations and be reasonably certain that they're not going to be hit with these fines. 
because you'd already gotten pre-approval from yeah, actually, my clients were my clients were the comp- the licensing companies. Yeah, right. So, so I worked with uh, like Muzak and yep. uh, DMX Music, AEI Music, which you know later went on to buy um, Sirius XM. You know, so th- yeah. it was the guys who owned the content were then giving people the machine with the content, saying just play, play this. this. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a loophole right there with regards to the pay to play thing, like. I'm from the music industry, so all of this stuff really gets my goat about it. It's why I left the music business, just because it's. I I don't pretend to install uh, to understand how licensing works in that industry. It's yeah, there's yeah. it's another industry that operates on wizardry and fuckery. So uh, mm. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Back to the dominatrix. <laughs> You'll get used to me. I see a theme. <laughs> No, seriously, I'm as vanilla as I come. There's, there's your title for your next podcast too. <laughs> oh, please don't even suggest another podcast. I've got two podcasts and a bottled beverage company. Three businesses as far and too many as it is. <laughs> my my uh my situation seems to be growing in the middle of a pandemic where most people's are unfortunately going in the other direction. So oh, distance distance learning. It's it's yeah. entertainment and distance learning. They're all they're doing very well right now. Yeah. Oh, it's it uh, is. It's uh, it's really great. Yeah. So back to coffee. Back, back to, coffee. to coffee. So I, I sold that business and I was looking for what to do next and, and got drawn into the coffee business, the coffee industry. I was living in Los Angeles in the mm-hmm. time at the time um, uh, in, in Santa Monica and um, somehow found out about the Specialty Coffee Association of America at that time mm-hmm. and showed circa, up. I'm circa, sorry? Circa like. Oh, about- um, 2000, 2001. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, Ted Lingle was in charge and it was the original crew and they had an office in Long Beach, a different office, uh, the original office. And I just showed up there and sat in on some training classes that were hosted by Sherry Johns. I don't know if you know Sherry. No. She'd be another really interesting person for you to talk to. Sherry Johns. Uh, yeah. Johns. Uh-huh. I call her, I call her Indiana Johns for her <laughs> that's awesome adventures in coffee she's nice. the she's the original she, you need to talk to her yeah and awesome. anyway she she taught me how to cup coffee for the first time and and um i remember i got back on the uh 405 to drive home and nearly threw up because i had, had so much caffeine oh but i thought, hate that feeling oh it was yeah it was it was my first cupping so it's like you're swallowing all the samples yeah, and you haven't you don't know better at that point ah! do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody is merging next to you <laughs> uh and um i i i just decided that's what i wanted to do so i looked at different angles of the business you know could i import some equipment from italy or manufacture something because i knew that that side of the the industry a bit better um tinkered with it for a little while uh, but eventually found that the information that I had from running my first business was helpful for coffee shop operators. So I put a shingle on my door and became a consultant and um, started working with little startup operations, some existing retailers that became roasters Mm -hmm. uh, and then some national businesses. And, And in about 2005, 2006, I started doing most of my business overseas um, first in, you know, uh, Turkey and Istanbul, then, uh, worked with some roasters in Morocco. And, and there was this theme that internationally, there was this growing interest in specialty coffee and they wanted to know how to achieve that. So I had a, a business background. I had been learning for those years about how the coffee industry worked and, and just made that transition. Uh, in about 2008, I met and worked with, um, the first coffee farming operation that I had oh. visited. I uh, just at that point had, had moved to Hawaii. I still wasn't w- really working. I never, I've never worked in the Hawaii coffee industry. I mean, I, I know. <laughs> really? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. People make that connection, which is logical, but I, I, I do, I do nothing here except live here and, and have oh, friends wow. here. Yeah. Um, so um, this, this was in India. I started working with a Robusta coffee producer who was very interested in, in finding ways of differentiating his coffee. And he was successful at doing that. And in fact, um, developed a, a good relationship, very good relationship with um, 
um, some people that you probably know in Australia um, with um, um, the Niziano coffee. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, has since that time been supplying them some very special Robusta coffee that they use in their espresso, and they have a great relationship. But through that process, I learned about some of the challenges that coffee producers mm -hmm. have, and particularly the um, the the less favorable coffee producers. And that that is what brings me to the um, point that you had raised earlier about the disconnect between the value chain and yeah. the coffee retailers, because they're, they're two different things. And what I, I noticed was that there's, there's two ideological camps within the coffee industry, particularly within the, within the specialty coffee industry. They see specialty coffee either as an opportunity to segregate and advance the very top 10% of mm -hmm. quality production, or they look at the other 90% and say, how can we advance that to be more like this 10%? Let me see if I understand that correctly. So here, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say that a little better this time. That was kind of confusing. So is specialty coffee about taking a 90 point coffee on whatever that theoretical 100 point score is and making it a 92? Or is it about taking your 70 point coffee and making an 80? Right. And yeah. That's a really and, interesting thing to pose because it seems like that seems to be defining, defying what the market actually wants if you look at the scale of how many people or how many companies are actually consuming commercial grade coffee versus specialty yeah. grade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I like that there is this, um, determination and passion to, you know, what I, you know, I, I grew up mostly around Detroit, so I make a lot of car analogies um, to, you know, can we make our Ferrari go another five miles an hour faster? Mm. But at the same time, I, I prefer the Toyota approach. You know, how can we make this car affordable and safe and a good performer for the largest audience? So my work really from that point on has been focused on taking the lessons that I've learned from the broader specialty coffee industry and consumers all over the planet and helping the lowest performing farmers improve what they do and how they access markets to make farming a more sustainable and equitable business for them. Well, when you look at it, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the majority of farmers in coffee are all smallholder farmers. Yes. Not by production volume. No, but, but by number. It, absolutely. Yeah, without question. I mean, you look at countries like Uganda, you look at Papua New Guinea, where I do a lot of work. You look at, um, you know, Colombia even. It's, it's mostly smallholder farming, Ethiopia certainly. In my, in my quest to understand more and more about the value chain in different origins. One question that keeps coming up in my mind when it comes to the idea of this yield of coffee uh, is, isn't proportionate to the number of producers that there are out there. Yeah. I'd say there's an inverse relationship. Right. <laughs> that, that, that is what seems to be coming out from what I'm – investigating I guess mm. but help me understand something as we are in a pandemic and as we're in a continuing coffee price crisis mm. on the sea market it doesn't benefit the companies that are involved in the high yield end of things to actually fix this situation because as the smallholder farmers walk off their farms, that's land that they can take ownership of. In some cases, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any real consideration. Um, there, there isn't a lot of 
it, it's not that logical process. They're not right. connected. Yeah, yeah. Um, very few things are, are logical in the world of coffee. Um, you you have producers <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you, you have you have producers that are very sophisticated in places like Brazil and in Colombia. Uh, in Vietnam as well, just, you know, in terms of productivity and organization of, of an industry. Mechanization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, they, well, they, they run it like a farm. It's agribusness. It's, I mean, it, Brazil coffee is the same as uh, wheat is or corn is or soybeans are in the United States. It's organized. They have, you know, drones sampling the the uh, the farms. They have giant tracts of land that are, as you mentioned, mechanized in, in many cases that make them extremely productive. So the volume game benefits them because they can make money by selling more very, very, very cheaply. When you go to a country like Papua New Guinea, suddenly you have 2 million, let's say, farmers mm. that are trying to eke out some additional living or, or in some cases, a, a full-time living, but in most cases, just supplemental income to try and survive and to buy goods and to buy rice and, and in some cases, to get kids into school. Um, it's... Uh, uh, th there's really not a connection between the two and that disproportion that that inequity of power uh, and organization you know benefits the big larger guys. operations yeah they become more efficient right and that's that's just economics that's the way it works um, so you need to find some way of um, for those small farmers to stay in coffee and I'll some people say why bother I mean I'll I'll address that in a second um, for those smaller farmers to stay in coffee and to, to make it part of their crop portfolio, um, they need organization, they need support, they need access to some of the higher tiered markets, you know, like Australia, like the mm -hmm. United States, like uh, different markets in, in Asia, Japan, Korea, now China, um, where they can sell their product as, as differentiated. You know, it's somehow not yep. this commodity. You know, you can either, in, in coffee, as in, I guess, most things, you can either get big or you can get good. You know, you have to choose. There, there's there's a, 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 a line between them that, that um, goes back and forth. So um, for many of these smallholder countries, really the, the best option for them is to get good mm. so that they can differentiate what they're doing from the mass commodity product and don't have to compete head to head on price, which they can't. They really can't because they don't have the productivity. They have many people that need to be supported from those activities. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to them. So back to why coffee farming, right? Uh, for, first of all, um, at least historically, it's been extremely important that coffee is traded in U.S. dollars. For a lot of countries like Papua New Guinea, the U.S. dollar is strong. Mm. It is um, for the moment. You know, liquid in international market for the moment. That's why I said historically. <laughs> <laughs> Give it um, 55 minutes and let's see yeah, what happens. Yeah, we might, we might want to Give it to Wednesday, to maybe end of next week. Euro or franc or something. But... but um, yeah, historically, the U.S. dollar, I mean, I, I heard a, a coffee farmer in, in PNG say it quite eloquently. I mean, when, when he looks at coffee, he said he looks at, you know, U.S. dollars growing in his garden. Yeah. And that's something that's extremely important because they're a bit more isolated or insulated from this, the currency instability you have in, in different countries that gives you some purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Um um in, in addition to that, I mean, quite frankly, it's, it's one of the, the few things that can grow and be as profitable as it is in many regions of the world that have smallholder farming. If you go through Central America, you go through parts of Asia, there aren't a lot of other crops that you can switch to that would give you the same sort of earning power, at least legally, without an awful lot of risks. Yeah. There's so many things we could say about that, but we'll just wash over the legally and illegally. Part yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that, that was... You know, not the the explicit goal, but um, the the USAID work that we did in Myanmar mm -hmm. 
um, that area of Myanmar is part of the Golden Triangle. So Poppy? when you were out, poppies, yeah, we were out in the in the coffee fields. You'd see all these little pretty flowers around. It's like, hmm, well, those are nice. Aren't those oh, lovely? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and at and, night, and, <laughs> you know, and and to just to to have um, the option, you know, you talk to the people, and they're just like everyone's the same. So they so just for want anyone to put food who on the that, table. They want to put food on the table. They want to have a, a good livelihood. They want iPhones. They want the mm -hmm. same things that you and I want. Everybody yeah. does. Um, and to have the option of producing a legal crop that is valuable, they're, they're like, sign me up. This is so much better. I don't want to have to deal with shady gangs. I don't want to have to do something which I know is possibly harming people. I just want to, I want my kids to have a better life than me. I want to put food on my table. I want to have something to retire on. That's. And people want to do a good job. Like they just want some peace yeah, of mind. Yeah, proud of what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, but, you know, if not coffee, if there's some other crop available, they'll switch to it. I mean, that's, that's logical. That, that's an intelligent, rational decision. Well, there's, you know, that's something that's happening around the world is the sea market <laughs> seems to, end up resulting in people not being able to get the cost of production back. They're cutting yeah. down their trees and planting other things out yeah. of necessity. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that is a, absolutely a theme in, in Papua New Guinea, as it is in many places around the world. You know, if they're not able to get the price they want from coffee, they'll switch to cabbage, they'll switch to a, a, anything else. Bananas, I mean, avocado. E uh, Ethiopia, they'll switch to, to chat. Same in Yemen. Um, is cot uh, one of the yeah. yeah go to go back to illegal crop because cot's mm -hmm. illegal right? Uh, it depends on where you are. It's very illegal here in the United States. It is entirely legal in Yemen. And I believe it's legal in Ethiopia too. Oh, and uh, Somalia, other parts of the world. It, it it's one of those substances that uh, I I think is probably blamed for. I, I, it goes know. in the marijuana yeah. bucket for me. Yeah, it, yeah. You know what I, I mean? I, I don't know the toxicology of it, but but it, it's it a seems stimulant. to me that it's it's a mild stimulant that you know, depending on which you know political group is in power, could be legal or could be illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now going back to what we we're talking about with regards to smallholder producers mm. getting the raw end of the stick mm. and larger farms really not needing that there's no symbiotic relationship there between large producers and smaller producers add to that a consumer end mm -hmm. of the value chain that pretty much gives zero fucks about where the coffee's coming from mm -hmm. because we the people in the middle have done an incredibly terrible job of helping them understand anything about the value chain. And it's difficult to inform them about it because we have 30 seconds to get it to them. That's if they come into the cafe to buy it. But in most geographies... And, and for the most part, they don't care. They don't no, care. they don't I mean, care. They, they, they don't have enough of an incentive to, to learn more about the things that they eat and drink right. because they're concentrated in other, they don't realize that certain things are actually very important. And, and it, you know, what, what can we say about that? That's consumer culture. But what it, do we it, do? Because this is uh, where I see this going is that if we don't find some way to step in mm -hmm. to help the consumer become more aware and look it's not just coffee it's wheat it's soy oh, it's, it's it's yeah. all ag products it's and food. it's it's the food <laughs> exactly and and soy seems to have done well thanks to a bunch of activists who let everybody know about monsanto and you should not consume glyphosate and this is why glyphosate is a problem and they managed to attach that with monsanto who have the uh you know pretty much worldwide rights over s soy uh because mm. of some again, wizardry and fuckery that they did with regards to the genetic manipulation of seeds, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. if we don't, um, if we don't help consumers understand what's going on, there's not really going to be any fallback 
to the value chain because the bigger producers are just going to produce more coffee. Right. Right. And the bigger traders are going to continue to consolidate and the bigger retail chains are going to continue to consolidate. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's two things. I mean, certainly, um, any kind of awareness campaigns that are, uh, aggressively pursued by roasters and retailers to make their consumers aware of why the product they're drinking is different. That helps. That's a differentiating does it factor. Though? Um, yeah, I think it does. I think that if you were to go back in time to when I started in the coffee business 20 years ago, there is a much greater awareness of the small farmer now than there was in 19 you know, or 2000, right? Um, I, th I think there is. I, I do yeah. believe that. And there's there's more of an interest. Is it always, you know, accurately placed? I think people tend to find comfort in the labels that they read and just believe in that. But the, really, they, they believe in the brand that, that they're right. buying from and how that identifies them. So, you know, by, you know, acting that way, by pur purchasing the coffees that support the smallholder farms in a way that is not charitable, but is, is, you know, equitable. That that's how you can create a sustainable supply chain. And, and also quite frankly, something that we ha as an industry haven't talked very much about is, um, legislation. I mean, there, there are ways that you can, um, you know, mandate purchasing or labeling or transparency in particular mm -hmm. so that the consumer understands. And that, that goes back to your Monsanto comment as well. If you want to talk about GMO labeling. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, there's, there's, there's some, there, there are ways of informing the consumer that also, you know, shine a spotlight on value chain practices so that it is widely recognized as being important. You know, then you get people saying, throwing the, the you know, over-regulation, hands mm -hmm. up in the air. But it almost seems like the last-ditch effort to save smallholder producers over the next decade or so because the alternative is... I don't see how they can really compete in the mid-range commodity to mid-range specialty market sustainably mm -hmm. in an environment where climate change is heavily impacting a lot of people. Oh yeah, that's going to be uh, that. That is the story. I mean, that's yeah. the story that nobody. I mean, we're all aware of it, but no one's really focused on it in this in this country, certainly. And I just wonder. <clears throat> there are no protections in place for those kind of smallholder producers, given that there's so many things pushing back on them. So even, mm -hmm. even if we solve the coffee price crisis thing, which will take decades anyway for us to establish a system that gives them independence from a futures market. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of the problem. You've right. got small producers that are having their prices set by the efficiency of the largest producers. And the influence of speculators that are and, using of, it. Of course, you know, of course. And, that, and that's, currency and exactly. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah uh, There are so many factors that are involved that are different from the normal economics of trade, whereby... It's, it's, it's almost arbitrary right. how the price is set. It has nothing to do with the product you're actually buying. That's my point. And, it, and mm -hmm. it's just an unfair way for smallholder producers to compete in amongst the giants who are using a market and are able to influence a market that then ends up with all the fallback on the small pro smallholder producer that digs them deeper into debt when they're mm -hmm. getting loans at 50%. Yeah. It yeah. just doesn't make any sense to be a smallholder coffee producer. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't, but it's often the best choice. Explain that to me. Oh, just because it's it's accessible, you know, it's 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 reliable. There's always trade there. It's liquid. It's it's um, more difficult. I mentioned uh, the idea of um, coffee producers in Papua New Guinea right. switching to leafy greens. Uh, they they you know may choose to do that, and they can get 
more money very quickly because it's harvested you quickly. Don't, you don't have, yeah, exactly. And, and like it's you said, credit up. is a big issue. Yeah. You don't have uh, access to credit so that you can get paid once a year. Um, but there's still issues with delivery of the product because there's no cold supply chain. When you're in, what does that term remote, mean? I'm sorry. It means that yeah, you're able to transport the product refrigerated to its destination. Oh, oh there's no, cold. There's okay. There, there's actually yeah, cold. There's no um, there's no um, route to market for a lot right. of those producers, so they can sell things locally, but they can't get to the major metropolitan centers. I mean, PNG is is particularly vicious terrain. Um, there are you know there's limited road access between cities. Mm -hmm. So most of travel is uh, certainly business travel is flying uh, and you take small jets to the, the different central hubs and then drive out to the, the farms from there. You'd be shocked the first time I, I went to the remote areas of PNG and was flying back to Port Moresby, which is the, the capital city. Um, Everyone, before they were getting on the plane, was going to the farmer's market that was across from the airport, the little airport, and loading up on greens and, you know, radishes and all this. Wow. It looked, you know, when they were getting on the airplane, picture a commuter airplane where it's like every overhead bin is just stuffed with Groceries. green produce. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> they said, well, we, we, can't, we can't get this stuff in Port Moresby. So every time wow. somebody comes out, out to the field, they buy it at the farmer's market before they go back back home for the night because there's no way of transporting it to a grocery store. Most of the, the vegetables and, you know, other produce that you're buying in the major city is imported from Australia. Wow. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah, because because and it's so... easy. Hello, Andrew. I think you're, are you there, Andrew? Are you there? There oh, you yeah, are. There, just, yeah, there you are. That was Just weird. Pause for a second. I thought you were really contemplating the last thing I said. <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, yeah, maybe that's Trump's people that <clears throat> finally heard our comment about him earlier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all logging in. <laughs> um, so so the produce in Port Moresby comes from mm. from Australia. Australia, New Zealand, uh, China. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how, uh, when, when you start talking about some of the difficulties of doing business in, in smallholder countries and just un underdeveloped countries and in general, infrastructure is a major issue. If you can't transport what you're producing to a central site, you better have a local buyer for it because otherwise you should be doing something else. I mean, that's. Yeah. Wow. What do you, what do you yeah. think that the future so, of it, like how does the next 10 years, provided we survive the next couple of weeks here in the US. Yeah, I'm worried about the next 10 days. Yeah, you and I both. <laughs> I just received a, I think is a very um, troubling text message from somebody that just says it begins and a link of something that oh, Trump no. has done. So like, I'm kind of nervous. I'm constantly my, living. My phone's on mute. I don't, I yeah, don't um, it's constantly. It's these few moments of bliss. <laughs> blissful ignorance i'm happy swimming in the quiet here with you andrew <laughs> the world can go fuck itself right now it's inducing so much yeah. anxiety it's kind of like you've got to laugh just so that you don't fall apart it's that's where it's, it is it's bad it's really bad the golden yeah. girls is uh has been my my motive it's funny you should say that i've been watching magnum no PI. way oh my god yeah, that's gonna be yeah, my next like thing 19 1981 it's oh, fantastic God, because he it's, was, it's I, you know everything and everything recovers at the end of the episode it's a little yeah. bit kitschy it's it's kind of funny i mean yeah, yeah. Perfect. it's a uh, magnum pi night rider <laughs> yeah we the, my wife and i were going through the the netflix list last night that was recommending to me it was that was on there a team a team <laughs> uh <laughs> oh, what else was there's so much good stuff that uh you know macgyver the original MacGyver. Yeah, oh, ooh, that's yeah, a good yeah. one. The original yeah, that's MacGyver. A good idea. I like that. Th those are the kinds of things I don't know why, but I have am watching really old movies. I, I think a lot of people are. It's comforting. <clears throat> it really just is to, to 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 put you back in that state of mind to pretend that things are the way they used to be when the world was yeah. a little more sane. It's going to be a minute before any kind of semblance of sanity. 
hits again. I was, uh, I got, you know, you're very well um, tapped into what the Australian culture is like and you know that. A little bit, yeah. It's this culture that I'm living in here and that you're living in here is very, very different mm. to the Australian culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for me to understand how the pulse of all of this works is incredibly challenging. And, and I'm, look, I'm no dummy. Um, but at the same time, I'm absolutely unprepared to face what's coming. Mm. And so be it. Like, this is where we are. This is what we've got to do. And we just have to figure it out, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It'll be an interesting week ahead. That's for yeah. sure. Um, I, I Put your head down. Keep keep working. That's all I it's can do. It's the only strategy I that's have. That's all I can do. Yeah. yeah. You know. It's like, what are you going to do? Sit and just like cry in a corner? It's like, oh, I mean, that do that for 10 minutes and then just get back and get to work. You know, things will, things will continue that that's actually an interesting um, lesson. If you look at some of the, the least privileged nations, you know, they, they deal with this kind of thing all the time. Mm. They're like a dictator. <sighs> ah, we've had four in the last year, yeah. you know, or, or a famine, a plague. Yeah, sure. You know, brush it off, you know, get back to work. I think that's, that's, one of the lessons that I've learned from working in some very difficult environments is that you can survive. Humanity is very resilient. And so are our, our social structures, you know, and, and as turbulent as things may seem, as bad as they may be, there's always a recovery. It will always go on. It might not look the same, but it will always go on. So I wouldn't worry too much. Just be a survivor. Keep yourself busy. Don't get caught in the crosshairs and, and, you'll come out on the other end just fine and probably a stronger person for it. It's hilarious when my family in Syria are looking at America mm -hmm. and they they yeah. are happier <laughs> that they're in Syria. That's a good then, example. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's one of those yeah. things of like, well, when your family in Syria are looking at America and saying, well, that shit's batshit crazy. That's when you mm -hmm. kind of go, oh, Maybe I should have got out earlier. Yeah. There, there's the thing is, though, there's there's been craziness uh, even in the US before. I mean, like think this, of, do you think? well, uh, I think on par with this. I mean, look at the Vietnam War in, in the 1960s mm -hmm. and how unjust that was and how, how much, um, uh, unrest there was among the public and distrust of the government um, look and, and divisiveness in the country as well with people taking different sides um, look at um, the um, uh, the civil rights movement the same same kind of thing I mean you had just incredible injustice that was happening and you had some people that were rising up trying to make a difference and you had a lot of people that were against them um, it, it's it's not you know, the word unprecedented has come up mm. an unprecedented number of times this year. But <laughs> I um, like what you did there. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. You see I did. I, did. <laughs> um, I had lots of time to think about. It. Uh, but but I, I I really don't think it's as unique as as we think. You know, these things these problems have always been there. The fact that it is as visible as it is might be the difference. You know. An interesting thing that you said there is the correlation between Vietnam and what's happening right now. And I was listening to an episode of The Field by the New York Times this morning. Mm. And they had interviewed someone who was in line to get a gun. And what they were talking about was the difference between what was happening in the 60s and saying that these aren't peace-loving hippies that are out here trying to take what we've got and that's when it hit me the difference between the two situations is that one side was advocating for peace and the other side mm -hmm. wasn't what we have here is i can't pick which side is advocating for anything that's even slightly peace later yeah. it just and I, you know think of it this way when, when we're looking at what's going to come next, 
it almost seems inevitable if we want to get to what's after that. Which is, I think, the path that we have to go through in order to get to the peaceful um, position that we all want to be in. But there's so much repressed trauma in this country Mm. that we have to allow it to play out. We have to allow it the opportunity to just kind of process and then deal with what's left. Yeah. Because peace won't be realized until it's all out there. There's too much damage that's been done historically and in the DNA of the culture of this country. This is a fear-based culture. Whether people want to call it the best country on earth or they want to call it like, you know, the wealthiest country in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Either way, there's some really great things about America, but there's some glaring challenges that are here. And mm. you as a traveled man has been to countries that are so much more impoverished than than the US could even ever dream to be. And, and a lot and and they're a lot more unified. Right, that's my point. Mm-hmm. They have yeah. what they lack in financial wealth over there. They have in a life currency that is community and connectedness and all of that kind of stuff that seems to get Fo- them- focus on the. They've, they've learned to focus on the commonalities, you know, to, on the on the shared vision of the future of the, of the positive things, even in the in the in the absence of material goods. Um, to keep moving forward because really your other choice is to devolve into spiral into conflict. Yeah. And they, and they see the value in not going there. And I, you don't want to go there. Yeah. They've been there, you know, a lot of post conflict zones and they're like, no, we, we, you know, the, the people that are old enough to remember never want to go there again. Right. And we don't have many people here that have experienced that trauma. We've had a very, comfortable living so i feel that what's coming is going to happen (laughs) and unfold and it almost needs to to re-inject some of that humility into the culture of how important peace is and why it's important to strive for that yeah i i I think we need to take this idea that america is number one and change it to be america is just one you That's know, really powerful. Yeah. I've never mm-hmm. heard it put that way, but I, I really like I'll, it. I'll have to put it on a bumper. Yeah. Oh, it's a t-shirt. I'd like one, please, <laughs> sir. Thank you. I'll take that. It's my new industry. <laughs> uh, with all the work you've got on, I wouldn't uh, imagine that. Oh. <laughs> no, no, thanks. So. <laughs> I'll give you plenty. some of my podcasts. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. I just need to find another 10 hours a day. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Um, so back to coffee, um, mm. how does what's happening here, if we do talk about the relationship uh, between producers and consumers, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's say the US economy does, which we know it's going to take a big fall. In the middle of a pandemic where a lot of coffee producing nations are being affected by what's going on, yeah. what happens now with the economy of coffee? When you combine the clash of a coffee price crisis with COVID, with economic collapse, mm-hmm. what do you think comes now? Well, um, it's it's obviously hard to say. Uh, you know, I, I, I in some ways I hope that there will be more of a disconnect from the uh, commodity system. That the there will be an incentive or some ability uh, for producers to disconnect their production simply to be able to continue producing coffee and that buyers will continue to purchase from those communities, from those parts of the world. I think that the interesting thing I've, I've noticed just as an observer in other industries during COVID is that there's a real wedge that's being driven within industries that creates winners and losers tell me more about that you know i I don't know if you've seen that so in some it's completely random i I think like if you look at um an example um 
uh, there, there's a hairdresser in the, uh, there, there's a couple of hairdressers in the, the town where my, my wife grew up and, and one of them happens to have an outdoor patio and the other one doesn't. So the one who has the outdoor patio is is doing as much work as, as he can possibly yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, get people through the the shop. Whereas the one that doesn't is suffering, can't work, you know, a lot of a lot of days. So you're seeing the same sort of thing in other industries. You know, while um, you know restaurants and entertainment venues are are folding, uh, you have this online culture and technology. All these tools that we bought to be on on YouTube today. Um, they're they're absolutely booming. So I, I think you're going to see the same sort of disparity in the coffee industry, just based on trade relationships that have already been developed by proximity, by uh, policies uh, between different countries um, that that you know will continue to buy coffee. I, I think, quite frankly, it looks good for Papua New Guinea because they have such strong relationship with Australia, mm-hmm. which isn't going to be as materially impacted as uh, the the mainland US. Oh, we should give our friend Gina a shout out uh, at this Absolutely. point. Shout out to Miss Gina De Brita. She's a, a dear friend of the podcast and one of my personal friends. And, and one of my heroes. She's incredible. And it's people like her who have, you know, made a commitment to, um, you know, increase <clears throat> the, the relationship like countries of PNG and the coffee producing and, community. And- and back to you know your question of how um, the retail industry can make a difference. I mean, she is a shining example yeah. of that. This is, I mean, she she takes it very far. You don't necessarily have to be as fearless uh, as as she is to um, travel and find the coffees of the oppressed and bring them to light. But at the same time, you know, choosing your your sources and understanding where your coffee comes from and making sure that the relationships you develop with those sources are equitable uh, is something that will make a difference. And it'll make a difference on a small scale. And as other people learn about it, they'll try and do the same. That makes a difference on a big scale. I just hope we can do enough. That's my, my big concern is like I'm not a savior and I'm not here to save anybody or give, you know, none of us can. Not when the problem is this big. We can only do small little things. But I'm just with all the things that are pushing up against this situation, I'm really concerned um, mm. about where it goes because it's it's a small number of people that, win the huge amounts of rewards that come from the big production companies Mm. but it's an enormous number of people that lose from the failing of smallholder producers that is the problem Uh, you know and back to what you said you know as an individual we can only do little things but um some people are doing just tremendous little things that, that make a big difference. I don't know if you've spoken to Matt Grayley no. uh, and some of the work that he's doing in, in Timor-Leste and um, Rwanda and other places. He'd be a fantastic interview for you. Um, and um, But you have to remember that lots of people doing little things can equal a big thing. Yeah, I also want to shout out at this point, that's such a good point. Um, mm. I want to shout out one of my mentors, Mark Dundon. Do you know Mark? I do. He's a good mentor. Yeah, he's. <laughs> he, one day he said to me when I started learning about a lot of this stuff, and look, 20 years in the industry and I really didn't know a lot about the coffee value chain. Um, mm-hmm. And I started asking Mark some questions back when he was living here, which seems like it was 100 years ago, but it wasn't that long ago at all. No, no, I saw him there last <laughs> Yeah, he, he was smart. He got out early. Um, <laughs> but... You know, he said to me, listen, I've been fighting this war for decades. It's your yep. turn now. You need to help make an impact with this. And and he's been mentoring me on that since then. And I'm very lucky to have him as a mentor. But he has done... He's, he's a perfect example. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, if anyone has been waving the flag for smallholder producers and been mm-hmm. getting incredibly frustrated with... Again, the wizardry and fuckery of people trying to convince everyone else in the industry that they're doing the right thing when in fact they're not. They're marking right. their bags with specialty coffee and putting shitty commodity grade 
coffee in the bags and it happens so right. much. Yep. And you've got people right. like Mark, people like Gina doing these incredible mm-hmm. things. Um, and it, look, it doesn't pay the dividends that doing the underhanded stuff does. But mm. if we keep doing this race to the bottom bullshit, what we end up with is catastrophe. Yeah. Because we can't compete it's... with the big guys. We, I mean, once we get rid of the smallholder producers and we're buying just from the big guys, we're in a whole new pool that we don't know how to participate in. Right, right. Well, I, I, this is where I get the rare opportunity to be optimistic because <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. I know I, 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 I know the fight. I know the, the potential outcome. But um, I also know that the younger generation, you know, the, the, the kids, you know, my, my friend's kids that are now, you know, approaching 20, um, look at the world very differently. Yeah. They've been raised in a world that is um, full of substitutes and full of um, inaccuracies and full of, um, you know, artificial artificial experiences and ingredients yeah. and information. And I, I really feel that they have a commitment to pursuing authenticity. And that's where um, the people like Mark Dundon, like yourself, like like Gina, um, that that's their really whether they know it or not, that's really their product. They're they're about reality. And that I see as being the new trend in coffee moving forward. Um, you know, even though there are substitutes and yeah, let's talk and, about that. You you were you were mentioning it to me yesterday. The uh, yeah yeah, I guess that is a good segue there. It's uh, so so anyway. So I, I see that the the real future demand and the value comes from authentic experiences and authentic products. And um, I was uh, outraged recently by the introduction of a company which is uh, just started in Seattle that is creating a lab-grown coffee, um, which is not a product of the coffee tree. It's in fact, um, uh, as I understand it, material that's taken from uh, green waste that is somehow processed and then bottled and sold as coffee. Wow, what kind of green waste? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. They call it upcycled organic material. Oh, that so sounds I'm not terrifying. Sure. To me, it sounds like mulch in a bottle. But you know, I'm, I don't want to just outright disparage them. But I think that there's a real danger in introducing an inferior substitute and calling it a genuine product. And for so many reasons. I, would would have no problem with this company calling their product, you know, um, you know, coffee substitute even or coffee, Pretend coffee, like beverage or you know, mulchy drink. I don't know, you know, come up with something <laughs> that has a, a bit of creativity to it. But they've essentially um, um, uh, appropriated, you know, the coffee industry terms, you know, calling their beverage coffee, calling their laboratory a roastery, um, wow. showing, yeah, showing, you know, their employees working with, you know, V60s and, and um, brewing coffee. So they've hijacked in, it. They, they've, they've just completely hijacked it, even, even started their office with the 9 million in venture capital that they received. Um, in the same block as the Starbucks roastery in Seattle. Does this company start with an A? <clears throat> it does. Okay, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, so I, I, I you know. We may I, be getting them I, on I've the podcast. Very, I, I'd be interested to hear their position, um, you know, because I, I, I'm I, very much in support of uh, entrepreneurial enterprise. Mm-hmm. I, um, I really like technology. I, I like what it does for humanity, and I enjoy um you know, 
the the better living that we have as a result of technology and problems that we've been able to solve. But I think that they're positioning this product in a way that could be disastrous for humanity. And when you consider, you know, you talk about the commodity industry and the impact it has on smallholder production, what happens when you can produce something that's materially similar in a lab in Seattle and sell it for a fraction of the price of commodity coffee? Yeah, this uh, and calling it. And here's the here's the issue: calling it coffee, so the yeah. consumer doesn't know the difference. So what happens next? Do coffee chains start buying that as a filler, where there'll be you know the same issue we have in Hawaii: ten percent authentic coffee, ninety percent you know coffee syrup. Yep. You know, I've and, talked about it before on this podcast, and regular listen listeners are going to be sick of hearing me say this, but I apologize to anyone who's heard me say it before. I think we have a problem with branding when it comes to mm. the word coffee because instant coffee is coffee and a $100 mm. But a it coffee. is coffee. The thing is though, it is it coffee. Is, it is, that. right. So, so I get it, but <laughs> roasted coffee is coffee. Instant coffee is coffee. $100 right. a cup of, cup of coffee. I always fuck that up. $100 a cup, cup of coffee is coffee. Mm. It's all coffee. And now if we add right. this thing to it and they're calling it coffee because the reason they can hijack it is because we have no actual clear definition of what coffee is because it right. means so many right. things that come from right. the same thing. Well, it, that, that's, but that's the right. point, come from the same thing. So it's very easy to craft a definition that says a product of the genus uh, coffee <laughs> um, must contain, you know, X amount of biological material um, of the real plant. I mean, that 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 seems like a a simple thing. The argument this company makes is, oh well, there's mushroom coffee and there's there's corn coffee, you know, and chicory yep. coffee, you know, referring to the Civil War when coffee wasn't available as a substitute. I've got to have them on the People podcast. Started I was, uh, yeah, I, I'd be interesting. You know, so that's the first argument, which I just reject. Um, the second one is that somehow this, the introduction of this product, will make the coffee industry more sustainable, which I I don't know if they've taken an economics class. You know, introducing a an inferior substitute masquerading as a normal substitute is going to be disastrous for the entire coffee industry. Um, it, it will drive hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people out of work um, very quickly. COVID's done that as and well. It is, is a risk to really anyone working in the coffee industry from the coffee producers, but let's not forget importers, roasters, mm. baristas, you're obsolete. Yeah. You know, again, I have a problem with technology, no. but call it what it really is. I'm I'm a big fan uh, of the, automation. The, I think that it will yeah, it will absolutely. elevate the industry up. I think it will help, you know, baristas increases productivity and profitability. It, it, it makes a better product. Uh, you know, sure, absolutely. But that's not what we're talking um, about the, here. It isn't. The third thing we're talking about an artificial substitute, mm. um, like like a fake like a fake luxury brand is what we're talking about. We're we're talking about a you know, a $10 purse bought on the street in New York that says Gucci on it. Um, that's clearly what it, it's, it's what it is. The, the third, um, you know, point that they make as part of their marketing platform is that coffee has a huge carbon footprint. Um, and by switching to lab production, you're going to reduce that carbon footprint on the planet. Okay. So it's okay. So there is, uh, there are studies um, that have been produced. There's one done in Costa Rica. Uh, there's a study that was um, published by um, Kim Elena Ionescu mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Special Coffee Association, who'd be another great person to yep. talk to about this. And um, there is a, you know, as an industry, coffee does have a, a reasonably large uh, footprint yep. with, with, Two caveats, two pretty big caveats that you have to look at the data in more detail before you find them. First of all, coffee is trees. <laughs> so if you're doing a carbon footprint <laughs> study. Oh, I, I actually never thought should. about that. Yeah, they're, you're planting trees, millions and millions of trees. So if, <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I, 
I haven't seen any data that Coffee actually takes trees. that into account. Yes. There, there is a an offset <laughs> sort of inherent in the industry. Second of all, um, more than 75% of the coffee industry's carbon footprint is in the consuming country. It's on a yeah. on a on a small scale with the roasting and a larger scale Consumable cups. it's all of the the cups, Plastics. the the retail shops, the electricity that's that's run on for the espresso machine, it's people driving to their drive through shop to to pick up their coffee and take it home. I don't see how that can be materially affected by essentially creating a consumer product when, when such a small, it was like a, I can't remember the exact number, so don't quote me. It was somewhere between 14 and 70, 17% of the total carbon footprint of the industry is in the producing country to the consumer's um, country. The rest is all inside the consuming country. And I don't see that materially changing from producing a beverage here. Yeah. I mean, there's people are still going to drive. I mean, maybe there won't be coffee shops. Okay, people will just be cracking open a can, but they're still going to drive to the grocery store to buy it. They're still going to. Well, you know. no, this company has. Um, they they have uh, like vending machine sort of things that they are yeah. already putting out there and getting people. I think they've got a couple in some targets, and um, and things like that, whereby you just you order off an app, you walk up, mm. and you just. You just grab it from a hole in the wall. You p open a shutter and it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of what their model is going to be like. Right. So my concern with something like that is are they making people aware? So if they're selling a latte, because there's mm. no defined legislation or anything like that of what a latte has to be made up of, right. Um there's nothing that says that they can't call it a latte. No. There's nothing that says that they can't call it an espresso with milk. True. Yeah, and there's no yeah, there's no definition, but there is in some I mean, this is not unprecedented. Um uh the beef industry has very strict laws that define what beef is. And what you can even say about beef. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, so Oprah helped it, escalate that extreme, situation, yeah, right? <laughs> it, it, exactly. But but nonetheless, there. I mean, it is it's positive. And if you if you look in Europe, there is already um, there are already rules in force in what you can call milk or cheese. Mm. So you can't have soy milk in Europe. Really? Really, it has to be a product, a dairy product. That is a so, law across the European Union. What do they call <laughs> soy milk? soy juice oh, i don't know that sounds Not disgusting that popular, but... isn't that amazing but, but, it sounds disgusting but it's yeah, the same it's just, thing it's just a name right <laughs> it's just a name but it, it's it's uh you know if you look at the idea of this you know um you know no uh, or vegan cheese or something like that i have i have no problem with um you know eating vegan or a product that simulates cheese you just shouldn't be able to call it cheese well let's <laughs> talk about that for a second because i'm a vegan <laughs> i know i know that's why i mentioned yeah. it that's why i say i have absolutely but no... here's here's the thing with that when you look at the definition of cheese it's the it's the injection of a culture into mm. is it necessarily a dairy product does it have to be a, a bacterial or fungal or um mold in co like culture injected into a dairy product or can you do it into something else and make it a cheese I, I say it's absolutely fine to do that and call it you know mold fungus injected into something else <laughs> you're right i, I think <laughs> just, you're just right so consumers understand what yeah it is, so you don't grab the wrong thing so i'm i'm a celiac uh-huh and and this concerns me yes. when I am buying, you know, meat free meat products. What's in that? Yep. Is it wheat gluten? See, I don't eat if it's any wheat of that gluten, stuff. I get really sick. Yep. I don't eat any of that stuff. It, the the issue is with processed stuff because Right. Processed. Yeah. It, people are not right. being open about what it is. If you have a processed version of coffee 
How do we know? Mm -hmm. Like you'll buy an espresso safe with the knowledge as a celiac. There's really Mm -hmm. no way that there should be any kind of wheat product that goes into that. What if there is? What if this upcycled material I mean. is wheat based? If, if this maybe yeah. maybe it's something I won't be able to eat. And if and maybe I won't even know about it until it's too late. And how does the labeling happen? Like that's the concern. If you're buying a to go coffee mm-hmm. and you've decided, well, I want to be really green and use my own cup, where does mm-hmm. the labeling happen? How are you made aware of whatever it is? It's a really concerning situation. It's it, it's a problem with the you know the legislation is not kept up with the technology. Who lobbies and on that, our that's behalf? That's why. Who who? Well, I mean, you you'd have to talk to your congressperson. You'd have to make it an a you know the direct uh, pressure can be put on the retailer if there are you know outlets like this in in Target. I personally would write to Target and say, these are my concerns. These are the people I represent. These are, these are why they're concerns and we're not going to buy your product. I'm going to ask a really silly question, but please humor me. Why is an SCA on this? Um, well, there's, there's a really good technical reason, <laughs> which is they can't. They are legally restricted from oh, they're a trade organization. lobbying. A trade organization. So if they're lobbying politically, that's considered antitrust and they are dissolved. So they can't. They can't. There's a certain percentage of activities that they can do that would support, but they can't organize like a, they can't organize a boycott. They can't, um, you know, just like they wouldn't be able to say, okay, we need to get all of our roasters together and set prices. That's it's, it's, it's illegal. Yeah. That's, that's anti- antitrust. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they can make people aware. Uh, they can, um, you know, certainly inform consumers. They can produce materials that could be used by retailers. Um, but as far as an organizing entity, they're really just there to facilitate discussion. So who would take the – is this the problem? We don't know who should take the lead on sorting out these issues. Um, usually, I mean, if, if industry – does these things independently. I suspect if it becomes right now, it's just such a, a a small spark of a problem that people are probably aware of it. And by people, I mean the larger companies, the governments of countries that are producing coffee, um, their, you know, political representatives, if it gets bigger, we'll start to see more coordinated action between them um, on a legislative front, um, diplomatic, you know, to put restrictions in place, certainly for labeling, uh, I would think. Beyond that, you know, just for, you know, uh, validation as as the product, uh, you know, of, of the viability of the product. I don't know if that's a really good way to say it, but... Essentially, if, if it becomes a bigger issue, I would expect industry to take the lead in protecting the consumers. Is it too late by that point, do you think? Is it like when the spark is small, it's easier to squash, right? Before it becomes a fire. Um, yeah, but that's that's also anti-competitive, you know. Oh, so right. yeah. It's gatekeeping. You know. Yeah, exactly. So why why not give them a chance? And and you know, if the consumers feel that they are harmed by the actions of a company, they should seek relief through our court system. It seems to be what's got us and in that, this that, position. Incidentally, that's, yeah, yeah. Well, incidentally, that's that's exactly what was done for the um, the Kona coffee labeling. Yeah, that's recent, right? That's a, uh, just last year. Very, very recent. Yeah, there was a lot of coffee that was, you know, finally the technology exists to be able to identify the origin of, of a brewed coffee. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Do you uh, know about and, that? Can uh, you inform us a little bit more on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm no, no expert on that subject either, but um, I, that won't stop me from talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I attended a, a conference where the producers of the technology talked about what they were doing. Uh-huh. And, and as I understand it, it was designed to authenticate the origin of, I want to say, New Zealand wool. 
you know, essentially they've got a, a broad spectrum of variables that um, they can use you know, chemical, um, you know, other physical uh, light analysis. I think one of them is genetic. They've got all these different markers mm -hmm. that they can use to identify products that are retained um, despite their change of state. So you can take a green coffee and then roast it and it'll still have these same chemical and, and um, you know, genetic markers retained through the process that can help you to identify the origin of the product. Yeah, cool. And they use that process to test coffee that was being sold um, very suspiciously at prices that would be far below the cost of production for a product labeled as Kona mm -hmm. coffee and found that, you know, some of these coffees you buy on a shelf at large retailers and through Amazon um, were, you know, declaring themselves as Kona coffee, some having as little as 1% of authentic origin coffee and some having none detectable. Wow. Yeah. So when records were subpoenaed by those companies, you know, they were, you know, found to potentially be, um, I don't, I don't know what, what the, the legislative or, or what the legal status is of, of that, that case right now, but essentially there was, uh, there were claims made that some of these companies were intentionally defrauding customers and lawsuits were, um, uh, there was a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. that was made by the Kona farmers or a group of Kona farmers claiming that they were being harmed by these actions. And it's, I don't know if it's settled, yeah, it's but settled it certainly at the end of last year. Mid, oh, okay. Late, yeah, mid I, last I, year. That's how closely I was following it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people who haven't heard about it should definitely go and check it out online. It's mm -hmm. really interesting to follow that case and to understand mm -hmm. how it ended up evolving because I just think that there's going to be either a lot more of that kind of thing happen as we start struggling and people look for easy ways to compensate revenue streams. Well, it goes back to the idea of authenticity. You just want to know what you're getting. I have a problem with that statement because I don't think enough people realize that they want, should want to know what they're getting. They're just trusting yeah. the labeling. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that's where I think we're becoming hyper aware that we've been tricked about a lot of things <laughs> and we haven't asked the right questions that, you know, that's both at a consumer product of the, at a consumer level of the product that we're eating as food, mm -hmm. as well as from a governmental and political level. We're yeah. becoming aware that we, there was a social contract. We have these weird kind of unspoken contracts with the people who buy, who make a, our produce and send us our produce and the people who sell us that produce. We assume and we trust that they are going to have our best interests at heart uh, to make sure that we get product that if it's labeled organic, it's actually organic. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the vast majority of them do. Right. But there are some who don't. There, there are some that don't. <laughs> I think we as a society and what's causing the unrest that's coming right now is that people are becoming aware that the contract has been broken. And now that they're aware that the contract has been broken in some places, they've lost confidence in everything. And so they just want to destroy mm -hmm. the system. Yeah. And yeah. on the other side, you've got people who are like, but I don't understand what it's all about. What, what's everyone so upset about? And they're not asking any questions. And I'm concerned that there's just going to be a total dissemination of all of it and we're going to lose trust in everything. And perhaps that needs to happen. I don't know. But I hope what does come back um, – particularly a post-COVID when cafes open up again. Mm -hmm. I hope that we find a way that we're able to open back up in a way that brings more, more consumer confidence for one, but more mm -hmm. product integrity that yeah. distributes the power, for lack of a better word, or the agency across the value chain. Because right now it's weighted in one particular direction and it's on the consumer right. end. And if we don't help move it back down the chain, I think that disparity is going to leave us in a position 
that screws us over down the track. Mm-hmm. Does that make any sense? It, it does. It does. It's it's you know the the flip side or or another interpretation of the the same thing I was saying earlier yep. about the the interest in authenticity. You know, to to know uh, right now, you're right. There's not as much. You know, people are either angry and want to break all their toys and go home, or you've got the other group that's just going along with the flow. Um, but I think, again, optimism in the younger generation that recognizes the disconnect, I, I feel that there's a strong interest in fixing these problems. And right. a lot of that fixing comes from shining a light on them, you know, transparency. On the on the positive side of that, I don't like that mm. word, but on the side of the things where we could actually use this moment to mm. better the industry, more people are brewing coffee at home than ever. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's and, a very uh, good point, optimism of optimism. Yeah, and it, this is where I, I am encouraging roasters to use the opportunity <clears throat> now that people are their own baristas to give them insight. We have a very u- unique opportunity to give people insight into how they play right. a role in affecting the cup right. that they're drinking every morning or three times a day. And, you know, some very simple ways of thinking about what they're putting into their body. Not just how they're brewing, but how they're putting it into their body and why they should right. be choosing our specific coffee to do that with, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and really the, you know, platform that you have here um, to be able to educate people is something that retailers and roasters can use to do that. Yeah. Well, we're hoping, I, go ahead. Ha, I was going to say, have, you know, have a tasting, have, um, have, uh, you know, organized, you know, activities for people at home to help them learn how to brew their coffee better. I've seen some of that. I mean, there, there are definitely roasters doing that and some equipment manufacturers that have hosted these sorts of events and, and had just little video tips and things on mm-hmm. on hand, but also talking about sustainability, talking about environmental issues, social issues. I think those would be really important elements of content. Have you ever asked any of your, con- I guess Hawaii would be a great place to ask this, uh, just because everyone knows this there. Have you ever done the exercise of just asking people that aren't in a coffee growing region where coffee, co- where coffee comes from? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I've... Um come in contact with it a lot just through other industry industries and also talking to journalists quite frankly that's that's the oh, fun tell one. me about that because well you'll be talking to some reporter who's been tasked with writing a story about this or has an interest in coffee i remember one time it was someone like a, a young reporter from a, a distinguished publication and at, at some point in the discussion about smallholder production he said i have to ask you what is coffee? Where does it come from? <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> like oh, okay, wow. It's fine. It, it, let's, let's back up. Yeah, it's like people don't realize it's a plant. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how it's like, oh, I just thought it was like a dried bean or something. That, that, that It's like, a, that's that's actually a plant too. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Where does food come from? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I talk about where things come from all the time because of my celiac disease. I, I ask what's in everything foods when they're served and we travel a lot like i do you have to yep. know what what's being put in front of you and you'll talk to flight attendants in particular and say oh is there any uh weed in this and they're like uh <laughs> they, they they not only do they not know if there's wheat in that dish they don't what? know what wheat is yeah. or where wheat goes wow. <laughs> and most people i think are like that like with food you ask them what's in the you know some processed food product in there there and they, even not even a complicated one ask them what goes into how do you make bread you know just what's in it what are the ingredients people have no idea that's concerning <laughs> yeah wow um i i want to flip the conversation onto something that i haven't even told you that i wanted to talk about this but i just was thinking about it and thought i might want to do i need my whip <laughs> Let no. me grab one for okay. you. <laughs> I know I don't have one <laughs> before I get any emails. Um, I want to talk to you about Bitcoin and coffee. Mm. Do you know anything about, is this a subject you know nothing about? I mean, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I just, I, I've had a passing, in, I have a passing interest in technology. So I've, I have an idea of what it is and how it's created and how it's treated. Right. I want to ask you, I want to ask you mm. about, given that we are facing some uncertain economic times from a mm. supply chain perspective and a global economic perspective, and given that fiat currencies seem, it seems to be the rage to believe that fiat currencies are not going to exist after the apocalypse happens. What happens in a situation like that? Um, like is Bitcoin, let me ask that a different way. Why isn't Bitcoin something that the coffee producing industry is thinking of transitioning to? Is it purely an equity situation? Well, I, I think it's more a matter of practicality. I mean, first of all, you need electricity. And telephones. <laughs> and Bitcoin. Or, yeah. You know, I, I, I have this discussion with, with um, people who are interested in adding blockchain to the oh, yeah. To, oh, yeah. to the value chain all the all the time. You know, in one week, I had like three blockchain companies contact me saying, "Hey, how can we do this in PNG?" I'm like, "Yeah, they must have been doing the rounds because." It's like, well, first thing first thing we need is power, and then we need a computer. Yeah, and then we need something to run it. You know, it, it, there's baby steps that we have to to you know introduce new types of technologies. So I think that just from a practical matter is not something that could be implemented currently in a lot of smallholder communities because there's just no reliable power. Uh, the, um, the next issue is just one of trust. I mean, having something tangible in your hands is important. If you work in smallholder uh, communities, you recognize that a lot of people, very few people, I should say, have bank accounts. Mm. Because when the bank, when you put the money in the bank, the bank is going to steal your money because they have, you know, so there aren't necessarily robust financial systems in a lot of developing countries that people have trust in their, so you, you currency in hand is the only thing. So they counts. get paid cash money. Everything cash. Right. Yeah. The producers, you know, in, in PNG, um, you are paid cash for your day's delivery of cherries. Right. And if you don't get paid right then, there's going to be a riot. Wow. Okay. I'm I'm glad you you helped me understand that because I was thinking it was something along the, those lines, but but I keep mm. getting contacted by blockchain companies saying it's mm. the new big big thing that's going to happen in coffee. It's going to save coffee, and you know I've been doing a lot of research on uh, Bitcoin uh, recently. Mm. And just try I bet you could do it. In, you could do it in Brazil. You could do it in Colombia. You could do it in other places that are a bit more you know, structured and um, have more infrastructure and awareness of, um, technology, but I think it would be extremely difficult to implement in most smallholder communities where the technologies could be most beneficial. Right. So it, it could actually have some benefit for our industry, but not as a whole because just simply because the barrier to entry is so high. Um, I would never make an absolute, right. you know, uh, statement like that, but I think the barrier is high, okay. so it's going to be very difficult. That's fair because a lot of people. Well, I, let me rephrase it. There are a number of people out there that are, are waving this this blockchain transparency and traceability kind of flag, but also at the same time mm -hmm. waving the flag of hey, listen, you know, currencies that aren't or, you know, digital currencies are the way to go to protect farmers and whatnot. But I don't think that that's realistic. Um, well, tell them to go spend two weeks in San Pedro Sula. I like the way you think, sir. <laughs> see, see, yeah, it's, it's like, disconnected. Yeah, go, yeah, exactly. Get out of San Francisco, <laughs> go down to Central America, spend a, not at the resort, spend it in the community, volunteer for a week or two with the organic farming organization or, or go down to... Um, the farmer to farmer program to help out people. I think you'll come back with some new ideas. Yeah, that's that's usually the problem. It's like when people try mm -hmm. to get into the industry out of corporate, right? They'll come from corporate mm -hmm. and I'm gonna open a cafe. It can't be that hard. Yeah. It's a whole different thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a whole different yeah. thing. All right, before we wrap up, um, 
what's the big thing that you think from a trade perspective is going to is going to be the biggest influencing factor over the next 12 to 24 months in coffee hmm. i well i i I actually do have an opinion, but I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I think it's going to be the stability of the U.S. currency. That sounds reasonable. A reasonable answer. Because all trade is based on U.S. I mean, coffee trade. The vast majority of it is, is U.S. dollar, and if we have hyperinflation, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what to expect. It could do a lot of economic damage. So you think that that is going to be a bigger influence than COVID? Um. I do. I do. I think, um, I mean, COVID is, is obviously extremely serious and it is raging out of control in the United States unmitigated. Which um, is and scary. we have, we have ways to control it and just people aren't complying and government isn't, isn't organized and there's no, you know, relief effort in sight. But, um, so that is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but, at the same time, in terms of just volatility, I mean, that uh, COVID will probably continue to cause a slight decline, depression in, in um, the economy if there is a lack of confidence in the U.S. dollar in the next couple of weeks, then you will see rapid change and um, swings in prices that have real consequences to people in coffee producing countries. Let's hope it doesn't happen, but it's, you know. Let's hope. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. I always hope I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't ask these questions of people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. You know, it's, it, uh, you, you've got. I'm not sure that I do. But, but you've got exposure <laughs> to, more exposure than most of us into the trade, the economic and trade side of our industry. You know, you, 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 mm -hmm. you do this stuff. This is what you do. So. I am I am hopeful that um, this country has a a peaceful transition uh, of democratic leadership or or even continuation of democratic leadership. I mean, just just so that there's integrity to the system that um, maintains global confidence or builds global confidence in um, the country. Uh, and and from the perspective of the coffee industry, certainly for the currency. We have a word in Arabic. We say inshallah, um, <laughs> which is, is uh, you know, we hope so or God willing um, because it's yes. kind of something that's out of our hands. So, you know, inshallah, that's all I can say. I, I, I have worked for months in, in the UAE and I'm very familiar with that phrase. And yes, it is very applicable here today. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can say. We say inshallah. Yep. This has been delightful. I hope you'll come back. I'd love to. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm surprised you're still interested in talking to me after uh, this time with me rambling on about all these different subjects. It's been more of like a therapy. <laughs> I find you to be a fascinating and interesting person. And, you know, I'm always Thank welcome uh, interesting people on this podcast just because we, well, we get to spit ideas right yeah it's what yeah. it's all about and the next time we talk i'll interview you and and um i'll do less talking no this is a conversation <laughs> there's no more or less i mean that's the point right it's just about let's have a chat and yeah, talk yeah. about things that we agree and don't agree on and explore them and understand each other and do all that kind of stuff so that you know we can perhaps expose other people to different options that they may not have thought of before so good. Well, I hope, you know, people listening, watching today have some new thoughts, have some um, new ideas, inspired maybe to go out and do something. Where, but, where uh, can they find more mm -hmm. about what you're doing? Because you're not on social media, are you, sir? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, got, I got tired of all those battles. Um, I, uh, um, that's a very good question. Website? I mean, I've, I've got... I've got a website. Sure, you're welcome to go to coffeestrategies.com. Coffee strategies I try and add a blog article once a year, so that should give you a good idea of what's happening. Now, there, there will be other activities. I mean, uh, we're, we're continuing to do activities advancing uh, the interests of uh, smallholder producers. I'm working primarily in Papua New Guinea right yep. now, but also um, certainly have a, a strong connection to other places. 
Um, but uh, you will see us somewhere or you'll see coffee from from the work that I do at a cafe near you probably sometime soon. Can't wait. Come back soon. Look forward to it. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have Everyone have an amazing rest of your day. Okay. Bye, mate.